Thank you. It's uh, wonderful uh, to be in Wichita. Um, my, my sister, who lives in Britain, my family are all in Britain, though I, I, I should say I'm an American citizen, uh, texted me this afternoon and she said, she said uh, where are you? And I said, I'm not sure. <laughs> I said, but if you, um, you know, if you stick a pin right in the middle of uh, the United States, I'm, I'm right there. A, a long way, as we heard earlier, from uh, the beach. Now, most of my congregation have wonderful excuses for not being in church on Sunday, and one of them is um, they have beach homes within a couple of hours of, of um, Columbia in South Carolina. I guess that's not one of the issues that you have to deal with here. <laughs> well, it's my uh, privilege uh, to begin, and uh, Dr. Godfrey uh, will continue uh, expositions, and, uh, and Steve Nichols will continue in these um, expositions of uh, First Peter. But I've been assigned uh, the very beginning, and I want to read chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, and verses 1 through 12. Let's read uh, the Word of God together. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Well, so far, God's holy and inerrant word. May he add his blessing to the reading of it. Now, in many respects, and I guess preachers say this about whatever book they happen to be in at the time, but uh, there is in many respects a sense in which First Peter was written for the time in which we live. I know that's true of all the Bible, but there is a special significance, I think, about First Peter because it is written in a period, as we've just heard, 
where Christianity is being assaulted. Now, those of us who lived in Europe have been used to this for half a century or more, but I think here and, and, and even, even in the southern states where one time, perhaps under the euphemism of the Bible belt, uh, there is the growing wave of animosity towards Christian things, and you cannot assume uh, any longer a Judeo-Christian uh, base or ethic uh, to society. Well, what is Peter saying? And if I were to, well, if I were to boil it down to a sentence, it would be this, that if Jesus is worth living for, he is worth dying for. And there, I think, is the twist, as it were, in this particular epistle, that Peter is, although he's writing, of course, to urge Christians to be faithful, to stand firm, indeed, against opposition, but he's also hinting that maybe standing firm will cost you, and maybe it'll cost you your life. I can't uh, stand here this evening, and as I was sitting listening to my dear friend uh, preach earlier, uh, my mind, uh, as it has been over these last few weeks and months, and particularly in the last couple of days, has gone to a f friend of mine. I don't know him personally, but he has become a friend because I've been praying for him almost every day. Over the last year and a half, he has been in a prison in Turkey, and his life is being threatened. And uh, currently, uh, I understand the president in his trip overseas is uh, going to raise this issue. I trust he does, and I trust that he will be successful, and that this man who is been arrested for no other reason other than he preached the gospel uh, and insisted on the uniqueness uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ in the face of uh, Islamic claims to the country and so on. And he was in prison for it and his wife and family are here in this country and I, I remember him because he's a member of the denomination in which I serve. I won't mention his name lest, lest that get him into perhaps further trouble. But I can't preach on this passage tonight without thinking of him. You see, this isn't just a tale about Christians who were persecuted 2,000 years ago who felt the onslaught of the opposition of Emperor uh, Nero in the late 60s of the first century. My dear friends, there are men and women tonight in their hundreds and thousands whose lives are being threatened. There are men and women who are being beheaded because they believe and trust in the Lord Jesus. This is a daily occurrence. This is something that is happening now in parts of the world. It's so very easy for us to live here, perhaps, and sit in these comfortable pews and look at this astonishing um, stained glass window. I'm glad I was preaching second. <laughs> when, when the sun has gone down, what a... What a gorgeous window this is. Absolutely breathtaking. Even, even in the darkness, it's revealing um, different colors. I, I need to get back to my topic. <laughs> I, I can't even begin to expound First Peter this evening without drawing to our attention the fact that brothers and sisters of ours are facing the very thing that Peter is addressing here. It's not an emperor Nero, it is something else, and it's another religion, or it's another, it's another philosophy, and, and, and so on. So the urgency to stand firm is particularly relevant. That's what Peter is saying. If Jesus is worth living for, then he's worth dying for. And he's writing, as I say, in the middle uh, of the 60s, uh, and shortly Peter himself, of course will be taken from uh, prison, and he'll be taken outside of the walls of the city of uh, Rome, as tradition has it, and uh, he will be crucified, and at his own uh, request, uh, crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy to be uh, put, as it were, alongside his blessed Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The man who's writing these words would be dead within a few years, crucified upside down. 
because he believed in the gospel, because he believed in the absolute uniqueness of the Lord Jesus, that you can be saved and there is no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. Archbishop Leighton, a 19th century um, Episcopalian uh, who lived in Scotland and ministered in um, Glasgow in Scotland, Episcopalians um, and, and, and Leighton uh, wrote uh, a well-known and much-loved uh, commentary on First Peter and still uh, to this day uh, re regarded as uh, something, uh, something of a of a standard by way of a commentary on 1 Peter, uh, says that Peter has three things to say in this epistle. And those three things are faith, obedience, and patience. Faith, obedience, and patience. Faith to establish us in believing. Obedience to direct us in doing. And patience to comfort us in suffering. That's his summary of 1 Peter. Now, it's also important for us to understand that the very things that Peter is drawing attention to in this, in this epistle, and, and, and in particular, the suffering, the trial and the, and the difficulty that, that he's warning Christians about, and indeed that his readers are all too, too uh, aware of, is a suffering that has come upon them because they are Christians. Now, suffering can come upon us for all kinds of reasons and, and for no reason at all. At least no reason that we can understand or discern. Uh, there are always, there's always, a, uh, suffering is always purposive. There's always a reason with God. But the suffering and the trial that Peter is talking about here is not suffering because we've done something wrong, suffering because, because we've walked into danger, suffering because it's our own fault, suffering uh, because, because, um, because uh, of, of something that we've done or said. No, the suffering that is, that is uh, on the surface here is that suffering that comes in following the Savior. Now, before Peter addresses all of that, and we'll see some of that tomorrow, he wants to say something very positive. And he wants to say five things in particular about what is true of us. And, and I want you to see something of the logic of what Peter is doing here in this opening section of, of First Peter. He's, he's saying something that's so very important in terms of Christian ethics. He wants to say to them, stand firm in the face of opposition and trial. But before you can stand firm, you need to know who you are. You need to know your identity. You need to know what the blessings are into which you have been drawn. And I want us to look at these together, five of them that he mentions. And the first, uh, that... We are chosen by God. Chosen by God. Well, this is a Ligonier conference, so what did you expect? Uh, verse one. This is a Ligonier conference. Verse 1. Uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect. And there it is, right in your face. It's in the Bible. It's here in verse 1. I didn't make this up. I wasn't... I wasn't told to speak about election or predestination or foreordination. It's right here in the opening verse, verses 1 and, and verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And not foreknowledge now in the Arminian sense that God can see into the future uh, what decisions we make and, and then he kind of checks a box. This is foreknowledge in the, in the biblical sense, to know, to love. He, he loves us beforehand. Before we were ever born, he set his love and affection upon us. Chosen by God. That's who we are. We are chosen by God. It's the title of a book, isn't it? <laughs> I had a Baptist minister come into my office this week. He's new in Columbia. He's a wonderful man, young man. He was one of these typical millennials. He was as 
fit as could be, wearing jeans and a t-shirt. I was in a black suit and a white shirt and tie. <laughs> Presbyterian Baptist. <laughs> he was telling me that he had gone on a, on a marathon run last Saturday up in Charlotte, and I said, I've never done it. It'll never be on my checklist. <laughs> I said to him, uh, tell me about your journey. What, uh, I mean, the, your, your story, not just how he came to Colombia. Um, he was born and raised in Colombia, but, but uh, he read Chosen by God, by Dr. Sproul, some 20 years ago, affected him deeply, moved him deeply. Um, still one of the books that he that he's uh, been influenced by the most. He, he didn't say that. He had no idea I was a Ligonier fellow. He was completely used to him. Uh, he, actually, I don't think he knew I was. But, but there it is, chosen by God. Peter is writing to, 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 to these exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, uh, modern-day Turkey, where my friend is. And they are elect. They are elect. Now, notice how he, how he passes this. Notice, uh, notice the trajectory along which the language of election and, and, and foreknowledge uh, goes. And you'll see he refers to the Father, and he refers to the Spirit, and then he, rep he refers to, to Jesus Christ. This is entirely and thoroughly Trinitarian. Now, I, I have something... Um, of an axe to grind. I, 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 I tell my students at seminary all the time, I see a trajectory that is, uh, that is kind of Jesus-centered and Christ-centered, but sometimes Jesus-centered and Christ-centered at the expense of being Trinitarian. My dear friends, if you're not Trinitarian, you're not a Christian. Does that shock you? If you're not Trinitarian... If you, don't, if you don't believe that the Father is God and Jesus is God and the Holy Spirit is God, but there's only one God, then you're not a Christian. And Peter is writing to these exiles in the dispersion in, in what we would call Turkey today, facing the onslaught of Roman persecution. And he's saying to them, I want you to think for a minute of what it is that God, the three-personed God, has blessed you with. You have been chosen by God the Father, set apart by the Holy Spirit, given over to a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's as though, it's as though he's looking down the corridors of history as as God sets his love on, on this one and that one and turns to the Holy Spirit and, and, and says, I want, I want this one to be mine. And the, and the Spirit comes to you and brings you to Jesus Christ. And as you're brought to Jesus Christ, Jesus says, I want to introduce you to my Father. No wonder, he says in verse 3, blessed. Is that what you think of when you think of how God has chosen you from before the foundation of the world? How he set his affection upon you? Who are you? What is your identity? What is your significance? Well, you're not just a thing of the moment. You're not just a Johnny come lately. God has had his mind and heart upon you from before the foundation of the world, before there was a creation. God had you in mind. You know, our pulpit in First Presbyterian Church is made of marble. <laughs> and it is, uh, it is more solid than the rock of Gibraltar. <laughs> so I'm used to leaning on it, and it doesn't give way. But if I lean on this, it, it kind of moves. So. <laughs> I wonder, does the doctrine of election bring you a sense of joy? Deep-seated joy that nothing else does, that God has had you in mind. You, you may be totally insignificant. Maybe you're made to feel totally insignificant. But 
God has had you in the center of his purposes from before the foundation of the world. You are not insignificant to God. God the Father sent his son to die for you. God the Father sent the Holy Spirit to call you and quicken you and introduce you into fellowship and union and communion with the Lord Jesus. Chosen. Chosen by God. That's who you are. And then secondly, a living hope. You see it there in verse 3? He has caused you to be born again to a living hope. You've been brought to a new birth. Actually, this language is not that common in the New Testament. There are other ideas in the New Testament other than uh, not just the, the idea of, uh, of regeneration and quickening, but here it is. Peter is saying, you've been born again, born anew. It's not important that you can give a, a date or a, a time. I certainly can. 11.30, December the 28th, 1971. I was 18 years of age. I mean, you can do the math as to how old I am. I wasn't raised in a Christian home, never went to church, had never read the Bible. Somebody put into my hands a copy of John Stott's Basic Christianity. It was a friend of mine. I was studying physics and mathematics. Science was the answer to everything. I wasn't sure there was a God. And if there was, it wasn't, he wasn't of any relevance to me. And I thought, well, what is this book? And because a friend of mine, in fact, my best friend had given it to me, I, I read it. And within two days, I was on my knees asking God to forgive me of my sins because I thought I was going to go to hell. And two days before, I didn't even believe in hell. I was born again. I was given a new heart. God took the old stony heart away. Now, my wife is, my wife is a boring Presbyterian. <laughs> We've been married for 41, going on 42 years. She went to church Sunday morning. She went to Sunday school. She came home. She sat and played hymns with her mother uh, around the piano. On Sunday afternoon, she went to evening church. She doesn't remember a day or an hour when she did not believe in the Lord Jesus. From the moment of her consciousness, she was surrounded by the gospel, and she believed it. God caused her to be born again in, in a way that was entirely unconscious to her. It doesn't matter whether you can give a time or a date. What matters is, do you believe? Are you resting in the gospel? Are you resting in Jesus Christ? Is he your only hope for salvation in this world and in the world to come? On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Then, if that is so, you've been, you've been brought to a new, uh, to new life. You've been brought to a new birth. And you notice the language. Let's pick it up. He has caused you to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is Peter writing. This is a man who saw Jesus Christ from the dead. This is a man who stood next to Jesus who had been, who had been raised from the dead. This is an eyewitness who's speaking here. This is a man who knows the power of God in raising Christ from the dead. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? In Acts chapter 3, uh, when Peter is preaching uh, after Pentecost, uh, Peter uses, um, well, he speaks of Jesus as the author of life. It's a sermon that you find in, in Acts chapter 3. And he speaks of Jesus as the author of life. And he uses a Greek word, um, archegos. It's quite a rare word uh, in the New Testament. A trailblazer. Uh, so the, the, the first person uh, to do something. Uh, I remember in the 1960s and uh, 
Well, there are some of you who may not admit it. You look as if you were around in the 60s and had a pulse. And uh, you, uh, you remember Yuri Gagarin, uh, the first um, cosmonaut, astronaut uh, into space. You know, he looked out of the little capsule and said he couldn't see God. What an idiot. What did he think he was going to see? Well, even then, as a teenager, I thought, and I wasn't even a believer, I remember thinking, what an idiot. <laughs> you didn't go far enough. <laughs> well, my point is that Yuri Gagarin was the first, he was the first cosmonaut in space, or Roger Bannister, was it, the first uh, person to, to uh, beat the four-minute mile um, race and so on. Jesus is the forerunner. He's the first one to rise from the dead. And because he rose from the dead, those in union and communion with him also rise with him. And you know, in a sense, that's already happened to us. Uh, we anticipate a resurrection of the body on the last day, but in a sense, we sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's who we are. What is your identity? You've been born again, and you sit in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. You've been raised from the dead. Spiritually, you've been raised from the dead. You've been given new life and power. You remember the two on the Emmaus Road as, as Jesus, who, whom they did not recognize, uh, began to open up the scriptures uh, to them? Did not our hearts burn within us? Did not our hearts burn within us when they realized that they had been walking with, with the one who, who had been raised from the dead and realized his identity? Did not our hearts burn within us as, we, as, as he opened to us the scriptures? Well, we are chosen by God and we have a living hope. A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not a dead hope, it's a living hope. It's a hope that is alive, and it's a hope that promises life. What a word that must have been to the original recipients of this letter, who were, some of whom were facing death and torture and execution, being burnt alive and being thrown to animals and so on in the amphitheaters and all manner of things that were threatened against them, that they have a living hope. And the third thing, an indestructible inheritance. You see that in verse 4. An, an indestructible inheritance to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and, and unfading. Non-perishable, non-spoilable, non-fadable. And in the Greek it rhymes. Those three words rhyme. Contrast that with um, the dispersion, exiles in verse 1, to those who are exiles. Well, in the eyes of uh, the world, maybe that's all they are. Strangers, scattered, exiles, they have nothing. They have nothing. But in Jesus Christ, they have everything. You have an indestructible inheritance. An inheritance that no one and nothing can, can take away or diminish. Kept. Notice in verse 5. Kept in heaven. Guarded through faith. Kept in heaven. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. Kept in heaven. Guarded, shielded, military word. Garrisoned. Well, Peter, Peter knew what it was to be assaulted. This is Peter who denied the Lord. He knew what it was to be assaulted by the devil. Doesn't he warn in this very epistle about Satan prowling about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour? Well, you have a glorious inheritance. An inheritance that is, that is imperishable and undefiled and unfading. Kept in heaven for you. 
glorious things of thee are spoken. Zion, city of our God, he whose word cannot be broken, formed thee for his own abode on the rock of ages founded. What can shake my sure repose with salvation's walls surrounded? Thou mayest smile at all thy foes. And that was John Newton. Chosen by God, a living hope, an indestructible inheritance. Well, this is tornado country. I've only seen a tornado once from afar in Mississippi. I lived in Mississippi for 16 years. That's my claim to fame. <laughs> I remember seeing a, a, that funnel, being absolutely terrified. Pulling over in the car I was driving, I had no idea what I was supposed to do. Whether I should get out and get soaking wet, lie on the ground. I just sat in the car. I saw the damage it had done later. Unbelievable damage. And maybe I'm speaking to some of you, I don't know, who've experienced that. I was on the coastline in Mississippi coastline after Hurricane Katrina saw the absolute devastation for miles and miles and miles nothing left but the bare concrete on which buildings had once stood a family in the church in First Presbyterian Church in Jackson, Mississippi where I served as a as the evening preacher for 16 years. And uh, they had retired, a doctor, his wife, retired, bought a house, built a house on the very coast of, of uh, Mississippi, on the Gulf, beautiful home. They'd been in it just a few years. They lost everything. The only thing I remember the wife saying to me one time, she went, they went down to examine, to look, to see if they could find anything. And she found one cup of a tea set that somebody had given to her on her wedding. It's the only thing she found. One teacup. That's all, she, that's all they had left. They lost absolutely everything. Well, you cannot lose your salvation. You cannot lose the inheritance that God has promised to you. It is unfading. It is imperishable. It is indestructible. Nothing can take it away. Glorious things of thee are spoken, Zion, city of our God. He whose word cannot be broken. There it is. An indestructible inheritance. Well, fourthly, a persistent joy. A persistent joy. Well, in verse 6, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Various trials. There are all kinds of trials. Physical trials and psychological trials and, and trials in relationships and, and trials in health and trials in the loss of money and finance and jobs and a thousand others. Various trials. You rejoice, even though you may find yourself undergoing various trials. What does Paul say in Romans, in his epistle to the Romans? I consider this present suffering unworthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed hereafter. Suffering now, glory 
hereafter. Well, does he put it when he writes to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, our present light affliction is achieving for us a weight of glory. Remember C.S. Lewis's book, uh, well, it's an essay, uh, The Weight of Glory. It's a title taken from this passage. Our present light affliction is achieving for us a weight, an eternal weight of glory that far outweighs them all. What a beautiful image that is. You've got the sufferings. And Christians undergo all kinds of sufferings. A marriage that is breaking down. A husband or a wife who has, has betrayed you. You've lost your job and you can't find gainful employment. Your health has deteriorated. You can't do the things that you once used to do. And it's, a, it's like a weight. It's like a burden. You wake up in the morning and you go to sleep at night and sometimes you can't sleep because of this weight. It's like a burden. It never goes away. And then there's glory to come. And you put it, as it were, in the balance. And, and here's the trial, and the balance goes down. And then you put glory, and, and it almost breaks the balance because it's so heavy. The eternal weight of glory is not worthy to be compared. And by comparison, this affliction through which we're passing is, is, is almost light in comparison. No, I'm not saying, and neither is Peter saying, that the affliction is actually light. But in comparison to the glory, it is light. You rejoice. Now, what does he say? Well, you remember in Romans chapter 5. Do you have your Bibles? Well, let's have a bit of Bible rustling here. Let's go to Romans chapter 5 and uh, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. One of my favorite texts in all the Bible. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Well, Paul, have you lost your mind? You might be able to endure sufferings, but that's not what he says. He says we we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. There is a purpose in this trial. There is a purpose in this difficulty through which you're passing. And it is to get you, as it were, into a position whereby you desire that glory and appreciate that glory all the more when you realize that here we, we have no earthly city that's worth living for, but we seek one which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. What did C.S. Lewis say? That pain is God's megaphone. And it can speak to you in ways that other th things cannot. Spoke to the dying thief, didn't it? As he endured the pain of crucifixion. As he realized that he was being put to death next to one that was altogether sinless. Remember me when you come into your kingdom, he cried. To which he heard those Beautiful, beautiful words. Today you will be with me in paradise. Now, suffering doesn't always do that. In one, it was life transforming, but in the other, the other, on the other side of Jesus, it only further hardened him in his unbelief. Do you find yourself in trouble today? Do you find yourself facing a future that looks troublesome? Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. 
Jesus said. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Let not your hearts be troubled. You see, when Peter says this, and what he says is, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, you get the sense that Peter is saying, it's not simply a matter of chronology, that suffering now, glory after. But Peter seems to be saying that the only way to get to glory is through the pathway of trial and difficulty. You can't avoid it. George Whitfield once said that God puts burrs, you know, those little things that, that stick to your clothes sometimes from, from uh, bushes with, with little prickly things, burrs. God puts burrs in our bed to keep us awake. Do you know something of this persistent joy? In this, you rejoice. Verse 6. Drop down to verse 8. With joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Now, people express that joy in different ways. Presbyterians do it very quietly. But don't mistake that for not experiencing true, genuine joy. A contentment with our lot. An assurance of the promises of God in the midst of pain and darkness. I was texting somebody this afternoon She's probably not far from experiencing that eternal weight of glory. A family have gathered. I promised I would get to see them on Sunday afternoon. God spares her till then. They spoke of a joy that only the gospel can give. As God takes this life into his nearer presence as she will pass from this world into the presence of the Lord Jesus. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You close your eyes in this world and open them in the world to come. In a moment. Do you know something of that joy, my friend? Because of who you are in Christ. Because of your identity in the gospel. No matter what's coming. No matter what horrendous difficulties there may be before you. And that's what Peter is anticipating here. This is what's true of you. You are chosen by God. You have a living hope. You have an indestructible inheritance. And you have this persistent joy. Joy. And then fifthly, a much-admired salvation. A much-admired salvation. And Peter speaks of it in verses 10 and 11 and, and 12. And he talks about it, first of all, in terms, of course, there was no New Testament. So the only salvation that they could read about was the salvation that had been written in the Old Testament. And we heard a marvelous exposition of that in Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaiah uh, chapter 40 uh, earlier. Oh, I would love, I would love to have been within recording distance of Jesus and the two on the Emmaus Road 
and beginning with Moses and in all the prophets, he expounded to them the things concerning himself. Well, Luke, could you not have told us a little more? <laughs> and, and you call yourself a historian. I want to know what passages he went to. Did, was it Genesis 3.15? Of course, it must have been Genesis 3.15. Was it Deuteronomy 18 and the, and the prophecy about the coming prophet and so on? Did he expound to them the significance of the Levitical sacrifices? Did he go to the suffering servant passages in, in, in Isaiah? Did he go to the new covenant promises in Jeremiah and so on? I want to know what passages there were. And you notice, not just, uh, not just the prophets in verse 10, but if, if you allow your eye to drop down all the way to the end of verse 12, angels. Angels. It's remarkable, isn't it? There's no gospel for angels. There's no gospel for fallen angels. The angels fell like humanity fell. But there's no gospel. The Bible doesn't speak of a gospel for angels. The salvation of fallen angels as there is the salvation of fallen men and women. So no wonder they are fascinated. As Angels get summoned and given tasks to perform and, 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 and they're there at the birth of Jesus and, and, and they're there in the garden of Gethsemane and they're there at the time when Jesus rises from the dead and they're there at the time of the ascension and they'll be there at the time of the second coming because they're all together fascinated. What is it? What is it about God that shows such extraordinary love for human beings? Well, do you see what Peter is doing? We're merely, we're merely expounding here on the surface of things. He's saying, count your blessings. Name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Do you remember in Pilgrim's Progress, now this will test you, we're talking about the second part of Pilgrim's Progress, the, the one, the, the book that most people don't read. You know, there's part one and then there's part two. Part one is the story of Christian. Part two is the story of Christian's wife and four children, sons. And in that second part, actually the second part contains some of the best illustrations and, and best use of, um, of allegory, I think. He talks about a man, do you remember? And he has a muckrake. And um, his head is down and he's... Um, I planted some plants yesterday. I, I was coming here today, tomorrow. I've, I'm going to be busy. Well, Sunday, of course, but then Monday I'm going to be busy. So, so these plants needed to be planted. I bought them a week ago. They were looking rather sad. My wife was going on at me, and I, so I, I came home about an hour early yesterday and uh, planted them. I have uh, Luther, an 85-pound chow lab mix here. I've got Gracie here. Um, she's about 50 pounds, and, and she's, a, she's, well, I don't know what she is. And um, <laughs> I planted these plants, and... Um, well, my wife sent me pictures of them today. <laughs> they are strewn all over the garden. <laughs> so this was me yesterday. I had my head down and I was raking the soil and putting in some mulch and stuff. I, I hate gardening. <laughs> I, I love the result of it, but I, I'm not... 
It was 92 degrees yesterday. So I had my head down. And Bunyan talks about this man with a muckrake, and his, his head is down. And, and all he's saying is, woe is me, woe is me. Life is hard. And my dogs are going to mess everything up that I've done here. <laughs> and Bunyan says, above his head is a golden crown. But he doesn't see it. Look up, my friend. Look to Jesus. Remind yourself in Christ by faith of all the blessings that are ours. Despite the trials, despite the difficulties, come what may, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word. How timely it is. Write it upon our hearts for Jesus' sake. Amen.